WAOB News 10 presents Dialogue, a weekly public affairs program exploring community concerns and spotlighting regional activities. And good Sunday morning to you, everybody. Welcome to Dialogue. So um, someone, a relative here in Albany, Georgia, shared some very, very good information and, and uh, a, a very exciting announcement about uh, someone who lives in New York. Now, I'll tie all that together in just a moment. That person who is in New York uh, had posted on Facebook, and I quote, so this happened. I was awarded one of two research grants to study why COVID-19 is so much worse in African Americans. The dean announced it today. Well, that post was from Melissa Davis, PhD. She is the assistant interim professor of cell and developmental biology at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York, and she joins us. Good to see you, and thank you for uh, allowing us to kind of talk with, talk with you about what you're doing in terms of COVID-19. Congratulations thank also. Thank you for having me. This is such an honor. Thank well, you. <laughs> well, for, for people who, there are many people, I'm sure, who will recognize you and who know you, but for people <laughs> who don't know you, uh, you grew up in Albany, uh, you attended yes. Westover, you yes. attended Albany State University. And yes. so the, my, my, my <laughs> first question is, when did you get, I guess, the biology bug? Right, so my mother was a science teacher. She actually taught in the Mitchell County School System. She taught all levels of science in high school there. And that was my first um, sort of exploration into science, if you will. So she definitely planted the seeds of science every day. You know, we had experiments growing in the refrigerator from time to time, and I would often go to work with her and um, help her set up her labs. So that was my first sort of um, introduction. I'll, I'll admit though, when I was at Albany State, my first year I was a pre-law major. And I decided as I was getting um, into my major that I actually wanted to do something um, that utilized sort of the inclination I have for science. You know, I felt like my talent, science came easier for me if you will, and so I felt like that was probably the best way to to use my time. You know, they said do what you love, so I went pre-med for a while. <laughs> okay, so you have actually been at Weill Cornell, uh, mm -hmm. what, since October 1st of 2018? Yes. And, and you work with a, a team of other biologists? Mm -hmm. Yes. So talk, so, talk well, about what, you, what your work had been up until uh, this grant. So I'll tell you that um, we actually came to Wild Cornell from Detroit, by way of Detroit. My first appointment was actually at the University of Georgia. So for some time, you know, probably a decade, I was already doing breast cancer research. And a lot of what I did was sort of in isolation with just my team in the lab, you know, molecular geneticists, students who were interested in some aspect of um, cancer genetics. I'm also a molecular geneticist by training. Um, and what happened was an opportunity came to actually link up with a clinical team. So typically PhD researchers kind of do their work in silos, but there's this uh, phenomenal breast surgeon. Her name is Lisa Newman. At the time she was in Michigan and she recruited me to come uh, lead her team to do more genomics research because she was very interested in disparities. And so disparities just simply says that there's a difference between the outcomes of a disease between different groups. And so what she was seeing, what I was interested in is why is breast cancer so much worse in African-American women? And you know, disparities generally is associated with lack of equity of healthcare or access to healthcare. But as a geneticist, I started to see trends where it also appeared that people of African descent had a certain type of breast cancer. So breast cancer isn't just one type. And so as we started to dig more deeply into that, we saw that the differences in the tumors also um, sort of gave a picture of a different immune response. And so Dr. Newman already had this international program where she was um, going to Ghana on missionary clinical trips um, periodically. And so she, in her endeavors, had collected these samples from West Africa. 
And so this presented a perfect opportunity to join with her team um, because I was the geneticist trying to find sort of what is the shared ancestry among African-American women, creating this unique biology that was linked to poor outcome or more death uh, related to breast cancer. And she had amassed um, this sort of wonderful set of samples. And so once she recruited me to Michigan, um, she started um, this new endeavor with Wild Cornell here in New York. And as you know, New York City is the melting pot and there are a there's a tremendous amount of diversity here. And we have every representation across the modern African diaspora right here in New York. And so we've started this new research program here um, amongst all of the New York Presbyterian uh, hospital sites in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. So that's how I ended up here. So you were um, studying mm -hmm. um, the disparities mm -hmm. and then uh, COVID happened. Yes. And so you uh, and your team, mm -hmm. how many people are again on your team? So I have, I have a team of um, students. So that number kind of fluctuates with volunteer status. Um, but then I also have two additional um, research assistants and then I also count Dr. Newman's team as part of my team. So she has a clinical staff of research nurses and surgeons. So I would say anywhere between 20 to 30 people are, quote, on my team. We also partner with the Precision Medicine Institute here. So you, uh, I guess you heard about the, the grant being available, and you and your team, uh, I guess, wrote a proposal. H talk us through that process. Right, so because COVID-19 at the time here in New York, as you know, this was a hot spot, and um, we all had to shut down. And the university started to see that we were becoming one of the leading institutions caring for COVID patients. And there was so much unknown sort of about the disease course. Uh, we started hearing, you know, anecdotally from various places across the country, across the world that, people of African descent, African Americans, minority populations were being diagnosed with more severe disease and that they were also dying more. I mean, at the time that I submitted my research proposal, I believe even from Louisiana and Milwaukee, the stats were something like 90, over 90% 90 of the death that they had at that point logged were, were only in African Americans. And so, of course, again, disparities raises its head and we have the same people who always study disparities telling us, well, this is because, you know, minorities live in high density, um, you know, areas in these urban cities. Uh, they don't have health care access. They have comorbidities. And so I started thinking about my research and I said, you know, that was sort of the theme of things when we started doing breast cancer disparities, that it was all sort of attributed to socioeconomic status. But then when we started using all of the, you know, technological advances in genetics and genomics, we started finding that there are actually biological differences. And so I started thinking about the fact that we are looking at this particular gene, it's called DARK. And we know that in tumors, dark is regulating how the immune response occurs in individuals and it happens to be different in people of different ancestry because this gene is regulated differently and so as we started digging deeper we saw the connection with for instance the same immune responses that happen in cancer are also activated during infectious disease and so we started digging into public data and doing some analysis with some of the samples here in New York. And we found that African-Americans actually appear to have this higher inflammatory response. And I believe that it's linked to this gene, this mutation that we, or variant, I'd rather call it, um, in this gene that we've been studying breast cancer. And so uh, we partnered with immunologists um, at various campuses here in New York. Uh, we also partnered with infectious disease investigators and everyone was really excited about it and they, and they really believe that you know this is probably real you know and so the institution in, invested and so now we are um ramping up to actually prove that you know it's more than just socioeconomic status it's actually a genetic reason why the disease itself is just going to be worse 
Well, we need to take a break, but w when we come back, uh, mm -hmm. I I'm just curious on, I, I know your being from Albany that you were keeping up with what was going on here yes. in terms of COVID. <laughs> uh, I, I yes. wanna talk about that a little bit. And then also um, the amount of the grant and, and how long you have to do your research, all of those things. We, we want you to lay that out for our, those things out for us. So stay with us. I do have this though. If you want to follow uh, Dr. Melissa Davis, uh, she you can follow her on Twitter. Uh, it's at M-E-L-I-D 32. Again, at M-E-L-I-D 32. Uh, we can follow her on Twitter and keep up with her research and her advances and, and, and keep up with her career. We're going to take a break and we'll talk more about your research grant when we come back. Stay with us. And welcome back on this uh, Sunday morning. I am still talking with Melissa Davis, PhD, Albany native uh, researcher. In fact, she's the assistant interim professor of cell and developmental biology uh, at Weill Cornell Medicine uh, in New York City. And, and uh, we're just having her, uh, her cel we're celebrating with her as she has just been awarded uh, one of two research grants to study why COVID-19 uh, impacts African Americans at a, a much higher rate. And, and so, first of all, with your being from Albany, and I know you're in New York, and that too was a hotbed, uh, for COVID-19, but as you were hearing the news from back at home, what were your thoughts? And I'm sure you were on the phone, you were communicating with yes. family members to find out where they were and how they were yes. doing. Yes, yes. So I'll say my first inclination was fear. You know, I when we first saw the pandemic coming into the United States, my, my first inclination was for instance, in African American communities, we kind of knew people who were in clinical research kind of knew it was going to be worse in those populations. But specifically for Albany, I thought, oh no, this is a close knit community, you know. Um, and it appeared that the state had not, you know, implemented any shutdown measures. And I thought, oh no, you know, I hope that, you know, someone, you know, in the community kind of gets the word out that, you know, it spreads without symptoms. You know, I started talking to my family about you know, wearing masks pretty early on. And to be honest with you, you know, when we first started hearing of it, you know, I started implementing some of these procedures, you know, with my own family, with my own children. And at the time, I remember um, some of my family could not find masks, you know, and so I, you know, did what I could to try to make sure, you know, that I got it down to them. But I think, you know, one of the things that, became sort of apparent to me is especially in Albany that I wish we had um, more centralized communication you know with with the community there and I mean that's also my my wish for the minority community at large I feel like we rely a lot on messaging from our institutions and sometimes they're not prepared to send those messages out in time for it to be a benefit to the community so um, I was definitely on my Facebook page, you know, commenting on, you know, stay home. If you have to go out, wear a mask, wash your hands. You know, I, I remember even we talked about how to make um, hand sanitizer, like with just aloe gel and alcohol when, you know, places were running out. So um, it was really scary. Uh -huh. Thankfully, well, nobody in my family really got sick. So, yeah. And, and of course, now with uh, the resurgence of COVID, you know, people are a little nervous about that, uh, especially you yeah. mentioned being asymptomatic, you know, not having any of the symptoms. And then th that is a possibility mm -hmm. in terms of uh, spreading. And of course, us not sheltering in place, uh, right. you know, with the holidays and everybody getting out and doing yeah. whatever they wanted to do. Uh, yeah. Of course, we're seeing we're seeing the result of that. That's nothing to be argued about that. I mean, yeah. that A equals the B and, and <laughs> now we have C. So there you go. Exactly. All right. So um, I, I'm curious, how, how much is the grant and how is it funded? So um, 
in my institution, we have a lot of philanthropic um, donations. And of course, you know, with New York being a hotbed and people really wanting to know more about the disease, you know, like what, what are the symptoms, you know, why are there so many different types of symptoms and, you know, how can we prepare for either prevention or once you have it, you know, what are some treatments that we could think about um, in terms of making sure that people who get the disease recover. And so philanthropic dollars were put together and I think the foundation collected over, over a million dollars. And so they're rolling out sort of these small seed grants. And so I was awarded one for about $100,000. Um, and we'll use it over the course of the next year. And so that funding is on top of other uh, funding that we also got. So we got a you know, $50,000 grant here, a $50,000 grant there. So all together, we probably have around $250,000. And that again is just seed funding. And so what we'll do is uh, deploy our research staff across the city uh, it's going to be a combination of looking at um, genetic markers of individuals who tested positive. Um, one of the things that I will pay close attention to is the immune response different individuals have. And specifically, I'm looking at individuals who have the most severe cases, so people who had to end up in the ICU and or didn't recover. What was different about you know, their genetic makeup, their immune response? But we'll also track information about their socioeconomic status. So where did they live? What kind of jobs did they have? Um, there's been some data that links um, severity of disease back to viral load. So that's also something, you know, that we're really interested in um, as well. And so over the course of the next year, we'll be collecting samples from the area hospitals. Um, and our institution has already um, sort of been collecting samples over the course of us caring for tens of thousands of patients that have come through our hospital. So I'll be investigating uh, genetic markers now, and uh, immunological markers. Are, are there any collaborations with other institutions? Uh, I know we've got some medical colleges and universities here in Georgia. Is there a possibility that there might be some collaboration? I would love to do that, actually. I have some colleagues at Morehouse School of Medicine, and so I've been reaching out to them, you know, early conversations. Because, um, again, you know, I've always been interested in disparities and how minority communities are impacted by not only cancer, but now COVID. And so they have a tremendous research program that they're starting in Atlanta. Um, and I think it actually will be very important that we uh, combine our efforts, combine our data, combine our samples. And I mean, the more samples we have, the more people we study, then the more sure we can be about the findings that we make. And so uh, I collaborate with people in um, Tuskegee um, in, in Alabama. And so we'll be working with them as well. Uh, my heart goes out to HBCUs, of course, because I am a product of an HBCU. So I also collaborate with as many minority investigators as I can, because typically we are the, the people who are in science doing the science that impacts our community. And so um, as we sort of as we build the program, I know the National Institutes of Health, so I was just a part of a meeting yesterday. The National Institutes of Health also has several nationwide um, projects up and running or they're establishing. And so there's also the possibility of connecting to a national network um, as well. So got to get the paperwork together and all the approvals in place for that. But, you know, fingers crossed, I'm sure we'll connect um, on, a, on a national level. And actually, I'd also like to mention we do, um, we have several sites. So I'm the scientific director of the International Center for Breast Cancer Studies. And we do work in Ghana and Ethiopia as well. And so just like the United States, for a time, their surgical procedures have to be shut down. And um, we reached out to our collaborators there in Africa as well. So I'll be also uh, collecting samples in Ghana and West Africa and Ethiopia and East Africa. Okay, we need to take another break. Uh, before we do that, though, I know that there are going to be people who want to keep up with you and your work <laughs> and, and what's down the road for you. Uh, you are on Twitter, and you can follow yes. Dr. Davis at M-E-L-I-D 32. That is her Twitter handle, at 
M-E-L-I-D 32. We'll take another break. Yeah. We'll talk more with Dr. Davis when we come Thank back. You. Stay with us. And welcome back, everybody. I am still talking with Dr. Melissa Davis, who is the Assistant Interim Professor of Cell and Development at D Developmental Biology at Weill Cornell Medicine. Uh, but I want to just share a few names, though. She, of course, is there now. She has just been awarded uh, a, a research grant uh, to study COVID-19. But when I saw these not notable alumni of Cornell University, I'm like, I've got to share this because this is so timely that Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of, Al of Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, Mae Jemison, former astronaut, and C. Everett Coop, former Surgeon General. Those are just some of the notables. But, uh, uh, you know, you said actually, was it um, Jemison who yeah. you had just gone to hear? Yeah, so she was here recently. Um, we were highlighting um, minorities um, in the alumni. So every year there's a celebration, usually during Black History Month. And uh, she was one of the keynote speakers. And so it was fascinating to hear her story of how she became an astronaut. And Dr. Fauci actually gave the, the keynote address for the commencement um, for Wild Cornell's medical school um, graduation this past um, spring. So yeah, we got to hear a word from Dr. Fauci. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious because I'm sure that there may be, um, you know, some of our viewers who are, are wondering the same thing. Going back to your research, uh, mm -hmm. and, and studying the, is it DARC, D-A-R-C, yes. yes. um, yes. that gene. Are you then saying that the impact of COVID on African-American or, or uh, com black communities um, are more, um, I guess, uh, there's more of an impact on those communities because of the gene or uh, so many times we've heard about the underlying uh, right. health issues, diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, high blood pressure, and, and, and all of those kinds of things. So uh, quickly, if you can yeah. tell us, you know, wh wh what is your research saying? So if I can give like a one minute spiel, because it's, it's a combination of things, right? I think that when we think about the African-American community right now in the United States and abroad, it's just a perfect storm of various things. So yes, the comorbid status is definitely one of the key influencers on whether or not once you get COVID, if you're going to survive or not. So for instance, people who have obesity and diabetes are among the top of those who have um, fatal events at the end of the infection. But all of this is sort of integrated when you think of what's happening during the infection. What happens is the, inflam the inflammation becomes overwhelming to the system. And so this particular gene actually regulates inflammation. And the variant that uh, arose in, in West Africa, uh, which is where we get it now, the descendants of West Africans, um, not having this gene expressed in certain tissues creates this chronic inflammation, which is, a, which is associated with obesity. So it's associated with autoimmune disorders already in our population. And then you put in the scenario of where we live. We're overexposed to the, to the disease because, or to the virus because we are essential workers. So we're out here. We're not able to shelter in place. And, and we have to go to work, uh, many in the community exactly. have to still uh, do the, that essential work. I need to do That's this, right. we're about to run out of time, but I want to give uh, your Twitter uh, handle again, at M-E-L-I-D 32, if you would like to yes. follow the work of uh, Dr. Melissa Davis, uh, as she is working on COVID-19, very timely work. Thank you so much, we're proud of you, and please, I'm gonna follow you, and, and please keep us Thank updated you. on what you are doing. Have a wonderful Sunday, everybody. All right.